So we're going to continue in our simple series. If you're new here, um, you can turn in your Bibles to Ruth chapter 1. Uh, we've been going through this series called Simple, and all we're doing is we're going to very well-known Bible stories that pretty much almost everybody knows, and we're just reading through and finding some very simple truths. And I always try to keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. I try not to go too deep with things, but just to say, hey, God, what are some principles or some life lessons or some application that we can pull from these stories and just, and if we, and, and we're going to, as we get a little bit further, we're going to take one Sunday and probably go through all of our points just to really fasten them down. Because as followers of Jesus, and as I've been saying it, as simple followers of Jesus, not like uh, not smart, but more like really just keep it plain and easy. And that's what we're trying to do is to look and see what God has for us. So for today, we're going simple, Ruth. We're looking at the story of Ruth. Ruth is a, a great story. It's um, a very, very short book, and, but we're only going to cover two chapters. And I'm just telling you, we're going we're gonna to read through a lot of the story. We're going to skip some verses here and there and all kind of fill in the blanks and everything. And then we're going to stop right where it gets good. And that's it. And then you're going to have some homework to do to go read the rest of the story. It's a pretty cool story, but I'll kind of tell you what happens. But anyway, so the book of Ruth is very interesting. There's a lot of cool facts about this book. Did you know it's, it's, it's one of only two books of the Bible named after a woman? What's the other one? Esther, of course. This is the only book of the Bible that is named after a non-Jewish woman, which is really, really crazy when you think of it. Um, the book of Ruth, it only has four chapters, like we said, and it's in total 85 verses. Uh, the name Ruth means friend, friendly, or friendship, and we see that out of her because she becomes this close loyal friend of her mother-in-law, uh, Naomi, and that's kind of why we're, you know, on Mother's Day talking about Ruth. And um, this is the only book in the Bible that's named after an ancestor of Jesus. So kind of interesting fact there. In, in fact, in Ruth chapter 4, verse 21, it gives us this genealogy and it says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, Boaz, the father of Obed, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. Now, we didn't talk about Ruth in that, and we will here in just a second, but we know that David was King David of the tribe of Judah and going all the way through of the lineage of Jesus. Well, if it's interesting, if you look at Matthew 1, you don't have to turn there, but in Matthew chapter 1, it's the, another genealogy. In verse 5, it says Salmon, so it starts out basically saying, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was, who's that? Rahab. What was Rahab known for? You're like, I don't know if I should say that in church. Okay, Rahab the harlot. Okay, she, she was a harlot. That's how she is known. And it's really interesting. She made it into the genealogy of Jesus. So Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. So in this lineage of Jesus, there's two very, very interesting women. One is known as Rahab the harlot. I mean, that's not a great name, right? Oh, look, it's Rahab the harlot, right? I mean, that's how she was known. So we have Rahab, and then we have Ruth, who was not even a Jew, not even an Israelite. So... Um, Really interesting, but if you look at that verse, Ruth is David's great-grandmother and Rahab is King David's great-great-grandmother. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Now, now, here's why that is so significant. Now, okay, yes, both of these women were non-Jewish. They, they converted, they followed uh, the God of Israel, Yahweh, and we're actually going to talk about Yahweh here in a few minutes. But here's, here's why this is so interesting that these two women are in the genealogy of Jesus. If you were writing a book, 
Okay, think about this. Think about all the people that have claimed the Bible is just a bunch of stories and yeah, it kind of coincides with history and some of the stuff happened. Okay, okay, okay. If you're writing a book and you are trying to make up the biggest lie ever known to man and you're making up a bunch of stories, you would not include this in your story. You would not have included, number one, a harlot, a prostitute, and number two, a, a, another woman who was not a Jew, much less women would not have been included in the genealogy of Jesus. It's the same thing when Christ was resurrected. Who were the first witnesses that saw the resurrected Christ? Women. Okay. Back then, you did not do that. Like that absolutely threw all of your credibility out of the window. You don't do that unless it's true. This would have been absolutely laughable at the time, except the writer knew this was true. This is what is going into God's word. So this book of Ruth, it's, it's really an awesome book. We don't see, and just like the book of Esther, we don't see a big miracle happen. If you read through the gospels and we'll, we'll get there one of these days and just start looking at all the miracles of Jesus, you don't see these really big miracles. But what you do see is this concept of providence. And providence is, is so important in the story and it's really important for us. So in fact, providence is the idea that God uses natural events or daily life, okay, things that happen to us, God uses natural events to enact supernatural results. It's, it's us just doing life, hopefully, prayerfully, in a way that honors God, in a way that is according to God's will, us doing life, and God's like, okay, that's a person that I can use. That's a person that is trying to follow my will. And I want to use that person to accomplish something great. And you look back at it and you go, whoa, how did that happen? Just like the story of Ruth. It's a very, very unlikely thing that happened. Now, we talked about it last week. Sometimes God will use what you're doing even though you are outside of the will of God. And that's actually what happens to this family in the beginning of the story. They're kind of moving outside of the will or the covenant of God and God still swoops in and uses them for his purpose. And we said it last week, you can let God rule over you or God will overrule you. The choice is yours. I would prefer the first half of that, right? It's, it's definitely better to let God rule over you than to, for God to step in and say, okay, dummy, I've let you go far enough. I will overrule what you are doing. Romans 8, 28. This is one of, uh, one of the most used verses, but it's also one of the most misused verses in all of scripture it says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That does not mean that God swoops in and in all things, God makes good. That's how people think of that verse. That's not. It says God will take whatever he wants and use it for good. Use it for good for his people who were called for his purpose. So Ruth chapter one, verse one. You guys ready? You got your Bibles there? Not one person. That was okay. Take a drink break here. Here we go. In the days when the judges ruled. Okay, pause. Okay, my man, you got like six words in or something like that. Okay, judges. This is talking about judges like the book of Judges. This was, of course, before King David, there was no king of Israel and Israel was governed or ruled by judges and they would be these heroes. We talked about one not too long ago, right? Samson. Okay, there were judges and they kind of ruled over the land. And it is thought that, that the book of Ruth, the story of Ruth happens around Judges chapter 10. If you're taking notes, if you're a geek like me, I dig that stuff. So in the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. Now, this was... 
not inside of God's will. Okay, I want to paint this picture. There's a famine in Israel. They, the, the Israel was going through these cycles where things would be going really well. They would forget about God. They would sin against God. God would send famine in the land or, or raiders, attackers and all that. Things would go bad and that, this was kind of one of the low points and then they would repent. God would restore them again and then it, it was this cycle that kept happening. So they're in one of their low points. There's a famine and they say, you know what? We're gonna leave God's covenant land, his, his promise to us, and we're gonna move to Moab, which Moab was uh, the descendants of Lot, Abraham's uh, relative, and which they followed this God called Chemosh. And Chemosh required blood sacrifices, human sacrifices, oftentimes children. So they moved from God's covenant land, although yes, there was a famine, but they did not trust God. They moved to Moab, to this basically an evil place. Verse three, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they had lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilion also died And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So things are not going well. We're three verses into this story. There's a famine. Naomi, Elimelech, and their two sons move to Moab. Elimelech dies and the two sons die. This is is not going well, okay? Um, Verse six, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. So they start going back towards Judah, towards Bethlehem, and Naomi stops and she's like, wait, 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 girls, this isn't fair. Both of you are from Moab. You're young enough. You, you, you guys should just go back to Moab. You, you're young enough. You can find new husbands. You'll be taken care of. Remember, women back then didn't really have a way to make money. So this was not a great situation for them to be widows. And so she's like, you should stay here. You can remarry. And, and I'll just don't worry about me. So that's what's happening here. So they... they They put up a little bit of a fight. They're like, no, 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 we're going to go with you. And they go back and forth. And then Orpah says, ah, you know what? It probably is better for me to stay here in Moab. So down to verse 14. At this, they wept aloud again. Then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her now. Pause just for a second. I need us to understand the gravity of these next two verses here. Verses 16 and 17 are one of the most pivotal moments of history because a decision is going to be made here that affects us being here in this moment right now. And you're like, they're just having a conversation. What's going on? Listen to what Ruth says, verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. What a massive statement. Ruth was like, Naomi, I'm in this till the end. I am your ride or die, if you will, okay, if we're talking now language. She's like, listen, I'm not gonna leave you. I I, I was committed to my husband. He died. I am now committed to you. I am going to follow you back to your land. Your land will be my land. Your people, my people, your God, my God. I am with you to the very end. If that had not have happened, 
you might as well call up the shepherds and say, don't look for the angel when you're keeping watch over your flocks by night, that whole deal. You can let the wise men know, hey, don't, you know, come over and search for the baby Jesus. All of that stuff you can pretty much cancel out, at least through the line of Ruth. But Ruth must have had some prompting, must have just had this character that she's like, no, 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 no. I'm with you, Naomi. I am with you to the end. Verse 18. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Now, in our series, our simple series, we only have three points. If we had more than three points, I would say right here in this moment, simple followers of Jesus honor their commitments, but we don't have more than three points, so I'm not saying simple followers of Jesus honor their commitments. <laughs> See what I did there? Okay, cool. But they do. Simple followers of Jesus honor their commitments. Ruth's character was so honorable that her, again, her, her commitment to her husband was like, that was, that was gone. He, he, he was dead. But she was like, you know what? I'm staying with you. You're, you're a widow, I'm a widow. At least maybe if we stick together, we can, we can make this work. I don't want to go back. I love you, Naomi. Uh, uh, just There was this bond between them. Down to verse 22. So this, this really, really cool thing, pivotal moment, verses 16 and 17, I'm staying with you. Drop down to verse 22. It says, so Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Now, what a weird detail to include, right? I mean, again, this, this big moment, your people, my people, your God, my God, and it was barley time, right? It seems like it doesn't fit in, but there's something that we're going to start to see that just starts happening, and that's that providence thing. That's God starting to work in normal circumstances for a supernatural result. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. This means he was a very respectable man. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Now what was happening was as soon as they got into town, they obviously, they had nothing with them. And as soon as they get there, Ruth says, hey, Naomi, I need to go out into the field. I've got to go what's called glean. There was this process called gleaning. And gleaning was basically the welfare system of the day. When farmers would harvest their crop, they would purposely not get every little speck of crop. They would leave some behind and then the poor would come in and they would glean. They would walk through and they would pick up all of the leftover scraps. Again, that was their welfare system. So it says, Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter, like immediately when they get there, go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered, notice it says, a field. Is there any specificity in that? Or it just, it seems like it was a random field, right? Are you with me? Okay. So she went out, entered a field, began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, here is this uh, another phrase of just like random chance. You see what's happening just like the writer wants us to know that this, these random things are happening. And as he gets further, as he's writing this, we're seeing how God is pulling all of it together. As it turned out, by chance, if you will, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Okay, so it just happened to be their relative. You think this was just a coincidence? No. I know some people, they're like, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God in incidences. God, God, is that how we say it? I don't know. Something like that. They say it. I don't say it. Verse four. Here's another one. Just then, here's this other phrase of random chance. It just happened to be at that time, just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. 
The Lord bless you, they answered. So he comes into the field and he just gives them a greeting. Here are uh, the poor people. Here's this rich farmer. And here's the poor going through the fields after it had been harvested just then. And he says, the Lord be with you. And they say, the Lord bless you. It was like this very, very cordial greeting. But the first thing he leads off with was this statement of God or this, this blessing. Verse five, Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, who does that young woman belong to? See what's happening here? He's like, uh, ooh, okay, all right, hey, 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 whose who's servant is she? So he starts talking with his harvesters. He's like, T tell me about that one right there in, 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 the, in the brown, the, the thing, and the, yeah, yeah, tell me about her. What, what do you know about her? What did you find out? So we, like, we see this kind of love connection starting to happen here, right? Verse 6, the overseer replied, listen to how he answers. She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. What was the report that he had given about her? She came here first thing in the morning and she's like still here except for one little break. She came and just rested in the shade here just for a few minutes in the shelter. But then she went right back out to work. What was he attesting to? This was her character. This was her work ethic. She was obviously somebody who was not afraid of work, who went respectfully and said, hey, uh, is it okay if I go in and I glean on your field? I know, I mean, this is kind of a thing that's supposed to happen, but I just want to ask you just to make sure it's okay. I know I'm a Moabite. You know, I'm not really supposed to be here. I'm not from your land. I'm not of your people. Uh, but is, is, can, please, can I just come and get some of this harvest? Verse 8. So Boaz said to Ruth, so he goes up and he starts a conversation, Mac Daddy here, my daughter, listen to me. Now, I do want to point something out here. The fact that he said my daughter means he is older than her, okay? Not like older enough to be a creepy way, okay? But like, like there, is, there is a bit of an age gap here, okay? So he says, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground, an absolute sign of humility and, and thanks. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? What a great question. This is an, it's such a good question. She's saying, why do I deserve special treatment above anyone else? Verse 11, Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you did not know before. Now, I have to think, all of those details that he had was not in the report that he got from one of his workers. So it just seems that Boaz did some uh, kind of undercover work and went asking around to find out about Ruth, right? He was really kind of digging her, okay? This leads us to our first point. Simple followers of Jesus understand the importance of loyalty and character. Now, okay, she caught his eye. She was, I believe she was very beautiful. But that'll only take you so far. Like if her attitude was absolutely horrible, if she kind of, it's, yeah, okay, she's, you know, the Moabite and she came here, uh, but, you know, she just like came on, she didn't even ask. And she's like stepping in front of people and like she's, you know, going and like when they're not looking, she's taking stuff out of their bag and putting them in hers. If that was the report, Boaz probably would have gone, well, psh, forget that and kicked her off of the land. 
But instead, okay, yes, she was attractive, but because of her loyalty, because of her character, when he found out, oh my goodness, this really is an outstanding or a virtuous woman, if you will. I, I, I'm, I'm a single guy and she's beautiful. I mean, he's starting to take this interest in her. Simple followers of Jesus understand the importance of loyalty and character. Proverbs 10, 9 says, whoever walks in integrity walks securely. Man, what, what a blessing it is to go through life and live in a secure way. Not looking over your shoulder all the time. Not wondering when the bottom's gonna drop off. Not wondering, oh my goodness, how am I gonna get through today? If you walk in integrity, you will walk securely. It doesn't mean all of your problems go away necessarily, but it means that God walks with us through our problems. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but, here's the antagonist, he who makes his ways crooked, which would be the opposite of integrity, will be found out every single time. Maybe not right away, but it will happen. I love this quote by D.L. Moody. If I take care of my character, my reputation will take care of itself. That's good, isn't it? You, you worry about you and the right people will see who you really are. That's what he's saying there. And Ruth was this woman of great character, great loyalty, and it earned her a great reputation. So verse 12, Boaz is still speaking. Now, again, here's one of those things that if we're reading quickly, we will pass over this, but something so cool happens here. He says, may the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, look at that. What do you notice about that verse? It's in there twice. I'll give you a real big hint. What's, what's weird in there? See, Lord, see how Lord is capitalized? When you see that in the Bible where it's L-O-R-D in all caps, not just the L, this means Yahweh. This was a specific name that they had for God, and this was the covenant name of God. When they said Yahweh, it reminded them of the God who made a promise to us that we would have this land, that he would always take care of us, and that he would redeem us. And so, okay, that's cool. He used that word. Who is he using this word Yahweh, the covenant God, to? Ruth. Was Ruth an Israelite? Was she a Jew? Was she part of the covenant? No, she was a Moabite. But he said to her, he knew, he knew her integrity. He knew she was not following the gods of the Moabites, of Chemosh. She was following Yahweh God. And it's, so it's almost like he invites her into the covenant of God, if you will. So cool that that happens here. So drop down to verse 17. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. She threshed the barley she had gathered, and it amounted to about an ephah, which would have been about 30 pounds or so. That would have been a lot of barley. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also bought out and gave to her what she had left over after she had eaten enough. Now, we skipped the part in the story, but Boaz invites her to lunch. And not only everything that she wants to eat, and she was probably pretty hungry, but she even takes a doggy bag home and gives it to Naomi. Verse 19, her mother-in-law asked her, here, here, it's underlined again, here's just one of those random circumstances that God is doing something in. Where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today is Boaz, she said. And if this were a movie, like, dum bum bum like, right? Like, that would have been that moment. Boaz, you know, like, no way. Verse 20. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. 
She added, that man is our close relative. Coincidence or God incidents? Probably more like God working providentially. God working behind the scenes to normal everyday life because then they were following what God wanted them to do. They were back in the promised land following the right God. Number two, simple followers of Jesus understand that providence is in the works. Now, it's cool and to read a story like this and see how God is working. I mean, like, I love the story of Ruth. I would be doing you a disservice if I sent you out of here and not said, guess what? The same God that worked all of this stuff out with Ruth is working in your life right now. Ruth is no more important than you. Yeah, okay, the lineage of Jesus, I'll give you that one. But guess what? God doesn't love Ruth any more than he loves you. And God has an awesome, I say this all the time, an awesome, amazing plan for each and every one of you. Some of you, it's to be this big thing. I don't know what the thing is right now. I can't think of a thing right now. But a thing, a really, really big deal, okay? Some of you, he just wants to be the most amazing mom and to love your kids and to show them Jesus and to live as an example. That is just as important as the big thing. So God is working providentially in every single life here. So the question is, are you working with God? Or are you letting God rule over you? Or is God eventually going to have to step in and overrule you? Providence, remember, the idea that God uses natural events, our daily life, to enact supernatural results. So I have to think, okay, I have to play the other side of this. I wonder how often we work against God. And God is really trying to work providentially in our lives. And it's almost like God's going... <sighs> You missed another opportunity. I, 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 oh, you were almost there and you just, you oh, did that thing again. And like, I'm, I'm trying here to work through you. And I wonder how often we do that. And if Ruth, Ruth hadn't been this woman of integrity, this woman of character, God might not have done what he did next, at least not through Ruth anyway. So I wrote this down, kind of a bit of a tongue twister. Do what you can and be who you can so God can do what he planned. See what I did there? Do what you can and be who you can, in the right way, obviously, so God can do what he planned. I do not want to stand before my creator someday and I know I'm going to, but to find out about all of the opportunities and all the blessings and all of the amazing plans that God had for me that I just totally messed up. I don't want you to be that person either. I want us all to be so congruently in God's will that God is just using us like crazy. That's what God wants out of every single person. Simple followers of Jesus understand that providence is in the works. Verse 20 again. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. She added, that man is our close relative. And now here's another phrase. He is one of our guardian redeemers. There is so much in these two words. I'm going to scratch the surface today, okay, explaining it. But there is so much here. But this brings us to our third point. Simple followers of Jesus understand that redemption is God's plan. Redemption is what God is all about, redeeming his people. What, is, what does redemption mean? I kind of know, like I know I take a coupon to the store and I redeem it. It has to do with a transaction. Here it is. Redemption is the action of gaining or regaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. 
It's basically how we purchase something or repurchase something back. And that's the picture of redemption here. So it says, she added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. That word guardian redeemer is goal. Goal, and it means to redeem or to act as a kinsman. It's kind of a strange term, but it was a principle that they had, especially in the Old Testament. The kinsman redeemer was a really cool thing. A family heritage or the lineage of a family was so important to them. If a relative passed away without any sons to carry on the name, there would hopefully be a kinsman redeemer in the family to kind of adopt that family to produce children and let that family line move on from them. That's what a kinsman redeemer is. And so Boaz just happened to be a, he wasn't the only, and this is actually where we're stopping the story, he wasn't the only kinsman redeemer in the family, but he was actually second in line. So this really cool transaction kind of takes place and he does the right thing and he goes out and says, hey, you know, there's, there's this field and if you want to buy the field and that's, that's part of the redemption process as well. And, and the guy's like, oh, you know, I, I could buy a field. And he's like, oh, yeah, and it, and it comes with a woman too. And he's like, oh, no, I don't need any more women. I'm good. I said, okay, cool. Boaz, he, he gets her. Okay, that's, that's the NTV, the new Trevor version. Okay, so the kinsman redeemer steps in Boaz marries Ruth, they have children, and continue that lineage. And what did we say in the very beginning? Great-grandmother of King David, who is right in line with Jesus, the Savior. All of this happened. Now, there, there is no big, crazy miracle in this story, but it's God working his providence just like he works in our lives to move this forward. One verse here. In Revelation chapter five, which is a really strange place to go from Ruth to Revelation, but I just wanna read this verse. John is having this vision of being up in heaven in the throne room. And they bring out this scroll and the scroll basically has the future events that are coming and the scroll is sealed. It was sealed with a wax seal and press and nobody could open the seal. And, and they're like, We're, what's gonna happen? We don't know. No one can open the seal. And then in walks Jesus and they're like, ah, he is the one. Jesus can open the seal to read what happens, to read what is next. So in Revelation chapter five, verse nine, it says, and they sang a new song, this is everyone in heaven, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because you were slain, here it is, and with your blood you, what's that word? Purchased or redeemed. You purchased for God persons, watch this, from every tribe and language and people and nation. Guess what? That's everybody. Everybody. The picture here is God's redeeming us. When he created, he created perfect. Adam and Eve, they were in. They didn't have to do anything except not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything was good. They were eternity with God. And guess what? They messed up. They brought sin into the world. That sin transpired all the way to us. God wants us, but that sin separates us from God. So in order for us to have an eternal relationship with God, he has to redeem us. He has to purchase us back. And the only way to do that was from the blood of Jesus hanging on a cross. His death, burial, and resurrection was the way that he redeems us back. But there's, there's a bit of a catch. It doesn't just automatically happen. It is a choice that we have to make. That we have to say, Jesus, you are my savior. You are my Lord, master in charge. I will follow you. Not your church attendance, not your good works, not your grandmama's faith, none of those things. 
but knowing that Jesus Christ is your Savior because what he did 2,000 years ago on the cross and living your life for him, giving your life. Jesus, you are now in charge of my life. That is redemption. That is God's plan. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we didn't mess up in the garden and you just left us to figure it out. Thank you that you are the ultimate kinsman redeemer, that you stepped in and redeemed us by giving us your son, Jesus, by allowing him to die a miserable, painful death, hang on a cross, shed out his blood as an offering, as a sacrifice for us, washing away our sin and our shame. Thank you, God, that you love us enough to redeem us. But God, help us to know, even though that is a free gift, that there is something that we have to do, not works, but trusting in you as our personal Lord and Savior. Following you, letting you be in charge of our lives. Thank you, God, that you love us that much. Thank you that you are such an amazing Heavenly Father, thank you, God, that you are the perfect example of how to live for your son, Jesus. God, I pray if there are some here this morning who do not have that relationship, who have not been redeemed, now is the time, Lord. Allow your spirit to work in their heart in a way that they are convicted of their sin and they turn from that sin and they turn towards you. And in this moment that they would say, Jesus, I trust in you. Not in myself, not in my good works or anything else, but Jesus, I fully trust in you. Thank you for redeeming me. God, we thank you for moms. God, they are so instrumental in our lives. And we just ask that you would bless them every day, but just a little extra dose of blessing today, God. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for, or they are. Thank you for how they step up in our lives. Thank you for how they speak into us. Thank you for how they just tirelessly work. God, I just pray that you would, like I said, just bless them, Lord. Help them to have a peace. Thank you, God, for our moms. God, I know this can be a difficult day where maybe we didn't have the best mom or maybe our mom was not around. So God, would you just give a little extra amount of blessing and peace to those. God, we ask that you would bless this time of offering. Use it in an awesome way, God. Help us to be generous so that we can bless this community and bless the world. Thank you, God, for organizations like Rain is Hope who do the heavy lifting, God, and we just support them. But thank you for our missionaries that we support. Thank you for all of the things, God, that we pour into that are furthering your kingdom. We love you, Lord. We praise you. You are such a good God. And it is in the awesome, most holy name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.